Hello. Hello, my dear friends. Hello to our DLD Think. For those of you who are new to the format, let me quickly explain what it is. As you know, all of you, that DLD is a community of smart, curious, and engaged people. Like every single one of you who is watching right now, you and you and you, thank you for coming. While many of us are still in lockdown, while we might be facing, some of you, the small steps of going back to the new normal, what is the new normal? I'm happy to reach out to you and share some unexpected dear dish thoughts with you, dear, dear community. Those of you who don't know me, who are the first time here, I'm Steffi Czerny, and many years ago, I founded a DLD conference. With DLD Think, we want to create a space where we can connect and discuss the rapid and unprecedented change to our world, gain new perspectives, and get inspired by the insights from our distinguished community members. Following our DLD 20 motto, what are you adding? We can all add something to this new situation, be it personal engagement, ideas, so for unasked questions or resources. Today, our DLD think focus on markets, marketing and wise men. Sorry for not wise women, but wise men is, I think, very good. And we have that great title, The Beginning of the World as We Know It. As we don't know it, as we don't know it. The beginning of the world as we don't know it. Oh my God. I'm very proud to welcome Sir Martin Sorrell, executive chairman um, of S4 Capital. And according to our friend and insa agency insider, Thomas Crampton, the fastest growing digital advertising and marketing services platform for the new age. Digital only, of course. And of course, you all know that Sir Martin built WPP, the world's largest conglomerate of advertising and communication agencies in a previous life, in a previous life, long time ago. And now with S4 Capital, he's showing us again that he will do it again. We are very proud of you, Martin. To help to balance this energetic guy, we have another very impressive guy, Yossi. Yossi Vardy, an amazing investor with an outstanding legacy godfather of startup nation Israel, global market expert, and of course, my long time, very dear DLD chairman and good friend. I'm so proud of both of you. So Martin and Yossi, what can you tell us about the world as we don't know it? I'm curious. You just told everybody, you just told everybody <laughs> about it, Steffi. We have nothing more to say. <laughs> no, no, no. Go ahead, my dear guys. So, Yossi, tell, tell us what's happening in Israel. Let's start up what's happening in Israel. There you are in Tel Aviv in your basement. Right now, uh, I think we are in the last uh, stages of forming a new government, which is a quite uh, strange uh, creature built of two, two fractions and uh, who got together very surprisingly. And uh, I think tomorrow the new government will be sworn. As far as the corona, we are, I would say we are maybe 70% back to, to business, maybe 80. We had a very low rate of dead uh, people. I think the number for yesterday was 290, which is uh, very about low. 30, 30 per 1 million. And... Uh, and this is in uh, general, and we are still uh, under under curfew. Those who want to to be careful, but we allow to go out, uh, sport, uh, sport, and uh, events, etc., are still off, and uh, things are getting uh, getting slowly back to normal. How slow? This will be the topic of our discussion. Before we go into business, I would like to say good morning to the Western Hemisphere, good afternoon to Europe and Africa, good evening to Asia 
Middle East and, the, and good night to the Far East because uh, only, <laughs> strangely enough, through the, through the magic of online, uh, last, last event we had people from 50 countries, which is quite amazing that you can sit at the comfort of your, uh, of your chair and run an uh, international uh, event. But let's go to business. Martin, you and I had an argument what will be the shape of getting back to, to business. So maybe we should start about your speculation about what's going to, to happen. I, and I don't know if it's being recorded. If it's being recorded, you have to be a little bit careful about of what you say. No, I, 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 would, I, I would assume that this was not off the record. This was on the record. After all, it is DLD and border. So we're, we're talking to the the media as well as uh, other communities or stakeholders. So um, what do I think is going to happen? I, I'm, I'm still in the V-shaped school. I, I, I just came off a call uh, with, uh, it, to America to, uh, to a guy, an interesting guy, I won't say who it was, but you shouldn't say who it was, but who tells me that he will have a, a drug uh, to counter corona uh, in, in, in production and available by the fall. Now, uh, I can't tell you whether that's uh, uh, going to happen or not, but it's just another one of those conversations that you have, and this comes from a credible source, where people are talking about potential, you know, today here in the UK, uh, Roche announced that their antibody test, or the UK government announced that Roche's antibody test, which is 100% according to testing uh, 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 infallible, 100% uh, correct on antibody testing, uh, will, will be available. So the UK government is scampering to, to get these antibody tests in. So the, the reason I'm optimistic uh, about a V-shaped recovery will come not in every vertical. Let's be quite clear about that. It won't in, in travel and hospitality and leisure, you know, Yossi, you mentioned in, in Israel, sporting events here in the UK, we don't have any sport live sporting events. I think in Germany, the Bundesliga is starting about now uh, behind closed doors. We'll, we'll see sporting events behind closed doors. I think there was a, a golf tournament without, without crowds uh, for charitable purposes, for purpose purposes uh, just recently. So, but, so there will be uh, L's to take that shape. Uh, there will be W's. That's there will be a, a, a recovery, and then obviously reinfection is a, an ever-present danger, and that will be we've seen reinfection in Germany, uh, we've seen reinfection in Wuhan in China, we've seen it in South Korea, we've seen alarms in in Japan, but. I think for two reasons, uh, I'm, I'm, or maybe three, I'm in the V-shaped camp for some verticals. The first is the fiscal stimulus that we've seen. And I haven't seen anybody put a number on the total of fiscal stimulus. I, I've heard, heard Ursula van der Leyen a couple of weeks ago on a WEF call talk about 13 trillion euros of fiscal support in the EU alone. Uh, the Americans, I think, Secretary Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, talked about uh, having injected three trillion when somebody was asking about the next, the next amount of money that the U.S. government would inject. He said, "Well, we spent three trillion. Give us two weeks to assess what the impact is." We're talking about huge amounts of money. The, the Japanese Prime Minister announced one and announces one day a trillion uh, dollars of support uh, in the U.K almost a trillion, well, a trillion dollars of support in the UK for small businesses through furloughs and the like. So we are talking about huge amounts of money. So the fiscal stimulus has come in, you know, basically the institutions, the banks and governments have said, we will do anything to get this done. We will be there supporting the economy, whether it how be well businesses. It how well it percolates down to the well, that's the, that, that's the main, a, that's, street, uh, main street shops, small shops. You know, the barber, the, the restaurant, the pub, the bookseller. 
Yeah, well, that that is exactly the point, Yossi. And I, and I said publicly before that, you know, take the UK, uh, large amounts of money actually in our industry or in an a industry that uh, the, the analog part of the industry, large amounts of gun money have found their ways into the bigger companies in our sector. And at the same time as a chief executive is paying uh, himself or his remuneration committee has voted him uh, a large amount of money as a bonus, whilst the shareholders don't receive any dividends or people are being laid off. So it's it's a multiple problem, Yossi. It's not just the fact that that money may not get to the small and medium-sized businesses. It's the fact that it goes to the fatter cats, if I can put it as hard as that, in the industry when companies are boasting about how much liquidity they have. They have 2 billion, 3 billion, 4 billion of liquidity, and yet so government we, money go, government money is going to them, and they are, as I say, paying bonuses either through their remuneration committee or to themselves. So that is something that has to be, in my view, dealt with, and I think will be in the fullest time. But firstly, it was the fiscal stimulus. Secondly, it was done at warp speed. I mean, we've never seen a compression, I think, in Scott Galloway's presentation, an excellent presentation you did with him last week. I we think he said it was 30 odd, uh, <laughs> 30 odd days. The indices fell as sharply as we've seen in previous recessions. And I think this one is no, is very different to every other one. It's more like a world war than we can debate that than, uh, than previous recessions, whether it's 9 11 or the dot-com bust of 2001-2 or the great financial crisis. But it's happened very quickly and the bounce back in the stock market has happened very quickly. And the, the fiscal stimulus has been applied at warp speed too. If you go back to the great financial crisis, which started to happen in September, October of 2008, the first TARP only came in in March of 2009, it was a big gap. And I think Ray Dalio has pointed out so that how, the quicker, much, how much GDP will we lose in 2020? What is your kind of uh, well, estimate? you know, th th there's a lot of numbers floating around. I mean, worldwide GDP, they're talking about seven, eight percent. Depends on what you think the scale of the recovery in H2 is going to be. I coming back to it, I think it's at warp speed. And the third point I just want to get over. So it's the fiscal stimulus. It's happened at warp speed, and don't underestimate the ingenuity, the money, the intelligence of entrepreneurs like the one I was talking to, to before I came on this call in America, particularly in Silicon Valley, particularly in Boston, in Bangalore, in Silicon Fen here in, this, in the UK, in Sao Paulo, wherever it is in the world. The ingenuity and money behind that ingenuity is huge. So... The, the rise of biosciences and life sciences as a result of what we've seen, sadly, with this epidemic, this pandemic, I think will escalate. So I'm basically in the V-shaped school acknowledging it will be different from vertical to vertical and precise. Q2 will be a bloodbath. It is a bloodbath. We are seeing very bad results, for example, from the banks with all the provisions they're putting in place from manufacturing companies and others. The tech companies, by and large, have done pretty well so far considering, we'll come, in, come on to that soon. So Q2, very tough. Q3, relatively better. And Q4, relatively better than Q3. And then into a better year in 2021. So that's what I think the shape will be. I know others have different views. And the reason is that fiscal stimulus is huge. It's come in very quickly at warp speed. And last but not least, there is a lot of ingenuity and brain power, not just in America, not just in China, but throughout the world, India, for example, that, that will be applied to it. Okay, let's, let's uh, try to, to zero in on some industries. Let's start with the industry which is closest to your heart, <clears throat> the advertising industry. You heard about the advertising industry, I'm sure. A little bit, a little bit. Well, how, my how guess do you see would, the, the industry behaving during the year? Well, the, the, industry is going to have a, the industry is going to have a very tough time. I mean, there may well be, you know, in, the, in Q1, 
uh, they already had the, the an, let me call them the analog companies as opposed to the the digital the new newer digital companies like I have to say like our own the analog companies are going to find it increasingly difficult they have the albatrosses around their necks just like media owners have albatrosses and and analog companies have the albatrosses of their their traditional businesses uh, those albatrosses are going to weigh them down as they try to maneuver through this this pandemic and you already see it take its toll uh, on them in q1 they're laying off 5 10 15 percent of their workforces across the board which you know i tried as you know yossi to run one of those companies for 33 years and i would say i was guilty at uh, mayor cooper i would say i was guilty of the same the same sin which is applying a blanket rule and what will happen with those companies is that when the recovery comes which i think will come reasonably quickly or quicker than some they will be bad ill prepared they will have got rid of a lot of their key asset, which is their talent, precisely at the time that they should be hanging on them, hanging on to them. So the industry in its analog form will be severely affected and is being severely affected. Maybe in Q2 down 25%, most of the analysts around 20 to 30% down in terms of top line. So the industry? Uh, for me, well, I, let's just broaden it for a minute. I, I think three major impacts at the consumer level. We're communicating online. Just look at what you're doing with DLD. Should should DLD move to more of a model of this nature? I think they should, but they may have a different view about this. But they should have more online virtual events like like this rather than live events. But basically, consumers are communicating online. They're shopping online. 32% of US households are currently, for the first time, using online groceries or online shopping for necessities. So online shopping, online educating. We're educating our kids, force majeure, because universities and schools are shut, but we're educating our kids and uh, our sons and daughters are educating themselves online too. So the consumer level, very significant change. And I, and I just recount again what Alan Jope, CEO of Unilever currently uh, and before, CEO of Unilever China at the time of SARS. And he recounts when he was in China how the, the SARS epidemic moved the Chinese consumer online and never looked back. So this is creating, and you know, you see with the rise of a company that Scott mentioned in his presentation, Shop Shopify, which is now the biggest cap company uh, in Canada. I was looking at some of the things that the senior management of Shopify was saying, and they see this marked change and acceleration in consumer behavior. So that's number one. Number two in media, you said media. Border, Huber border moved the border empire online faster than most newspaper and magazine groups. But there are still, you know, today BuzzFeed announced, even in the digital space, that it was closing a significant part of its operations. The Jewish Chronicle, near and dear to your heart, my heart, being in a, it been in existence in the UK since 1867, closed during COVID. They shut down their paper version. Uh, they had gone to a digital forever. version. And, Close now. They may come back again in some form. Isn't this, but, isn't this saying that the empire, the British Empire, is falling apart? Well, I, I wouldn't say that the Jewish Chronicle was representative of the British Empire. You'll say I, I hate to correct you. I think it's slightly different than that. Um, you know, it's a small group of people. It's what four hundred thousand or whatever number of people were were reading the Jewish Chronicle in one way or another. But it's a small group. But look, it, it's just emblematic of what is happening. You see it in newspapers and magazines. You see it in linear TV, the pressure that ITV or ProSieben in Germany is under and private equity is circling some of these companies now because they see a, 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 a compression in valuations. 
On the positive side, you see with streamers like Netflix and Disney Plus, Disney launches probably one of the most successful new product and introductions, 50 million plus subscriptions that we've seen ever. So but there Disney, are positive... Disney is very, excuse me, Disney is very interesting because on the one hand, they have this amazing streaming new business which recruited, uh, I don't know, 50, 60 million subscribers yeah. in no time. But on the other hand, they have the exact opposite, you know, in their park themes, hotels, uh, cruise ships, etc. So they well, really they, they have, you the two they, sides. They, they, have, they have some of the U's or I, I don't think they have the, well, they may have some of the L's as well. I mean, it may be that the cruise business will never be the same again. I was I was listening to Brian Chesky, who founded Airbnb, interestingly, in the last recession in 2008. And then here he is again, having to have a standby loan, I think, from uh, Silver Lake and others of a billion dollars uh, for Airbnb. But he was talking really constructively because he'd been through this experience before, about how he alters the Airbnb model to what's going to happen on travel. So business travel will be reduced. What can you tell us about in, Amazon in, and, uh, and Walmart? Well, just let me finish on that. And he says about leisure travel being more domestic than international. So he's already playing. A Amazon, so that's consumer and media. And the third area is digital transformation, which comes back to the Amazon and Walmart question. The third area, enterprise companies, particularly those companies that are uncontrolled listed companies, that's where control does not rest with management, where there's a separation between management and ownership, particularly in those companies where the average CEO would last five years or so as CEO of the company, before COVID, they were reluctant to disturb the status quo by through accelerating digital transformation. Now, all bets are off. I've said Q2 is very tough, at least for most companies. So there is no downside of upsetting the apple cart or the status quo by pushing digital transformation through strongly. We had a, a call a week ago with 12 CMOs chief digital officers of major companies in America. We had about an hour and a half on a call like this. And it was really interesting. All 12 of them were saying that the C-suite was demanding strong and faster digital transformation. This morning, or yesterday morning, the World Federation of Advertisers pointed that out in their report about what was happening to ad expenditure in our industry. They said that digital transformation in companies, in enterprises, was being accelerated even faster. Now, who are the beneficiaries of that? One of them is Amazon. One of them is Walmart. You know, Doug, who's the, the CEO of Walmart, has, Macmillan, has changed the format of Walmart to accommodate. He's moved from analog to digital extremely rapidly. And as Scott pointed out again in his presentation, the the only two retailers really to increase their market cap in recent times and amazon very significantly but walmart almost uh, as not as significantly but but a significant sum are those two companies and I, i've got to tell you you know we have a, a a little bit to do with with amazon one of our clients and we work closely with them on their advertising platform they are a remarkable company. They are the, the most valuable company on the planet, 1.4 trillion, whatever it is. They will, again, as Scott says, they will get, in my view, to 2 trillion quicker than people think. But the amazing thing is, despite being the most valuable company on the planet, they turn on a sixpence. Their, their COVID testing and tracking platform, which they're developing for their own use, and which will they will probably license as a technology for others to use is incredible. And you know, he's investing what a billion dollars in that out of the four billion that he's investing in various areas. When I say he, Jeff Bezos is investing in various areas of his operation. But the key skill that they have, I think, 
is agility. They, they turn on a sixpence even in the course of what's going on. I'll give you another example. Facebook, at a time when there's tremendous pressure, even for the digital giants, because their growth rates have subsided, uh, they're not as good as they were. You know, the digital industry was growing at 20 percent. Uh, we were growing at about double the rate that rate last year. Our rate has slowed in the first quarter to about 20 percent, but the industry has come down significantly. But Facebook, in the teeth of this crisis, what are they doing? Investing six billion dollars in taking a 10 percent stake in Reliance Geo in India, Mukesh Ambani's company in India, and and with with big social consequences. Because one of the one of the areas that that platform will explore is helping small. Coming back to your question about small and medium sized businesses, helping small and medium sized distribution businesses in India, which are a big political force because it's such a big industry, so it has importance from a Prime Minister Modi's point of view. Investing in that platform to to build it, it's building out its own equivalent to Zoom and technology that we're using, Google Hangout, uh, Microsoft Teams, all the, the alternatives. And it's doing a fairly significant branding campaign, which I think is an excellent campaign. We, we have not done it, sadly, but uh, they, they excellent campaign, uh, which is rebranding uh, and repositioning Facebook, having gone through the difficulties that they had in the past. So, there are very profound changes taking place at the consumer level, at media level, and last but not least, at the enterprise level, probably the most important. One other thing to say, there's also very profound changes taking place in the way that we work. I mean, we're 2,500 people in 30 countries. Already? We have already, yeah, yes, we have already cut uh, our leases in London and New York, for example, because we believe there will be a permanent change, probably, in the way that people will work. I, I wouldn't go as far as to say, I think, as Twitter has said, no more offices. We think offices, physical locations, plays an important role in building the culture of the organization. You know, we meet Every day today at two o'clock, for example, the top eight people in our company meet to discuss what's going on with our people, what's going on with our clients and what's going on with our finances. Obviously, we call it the CCG, the coronavirus crisis group. But, you know, we talk about this, this the offices and how we're going to configure our offices in the future. I don't think we will abandon offices completely. But what we will do is we'll probably reduce the office footprint, change the format of the offices and the layout of the offices. I'll give you another example. Uh, editor of a major news. Interfere because uh, we would like to leave some time for Q and A, and I would like to move to another two two okay, important topic. If it's okay with you, go ahead. Okay, number one, I, we all, we all uh, know that uh, about your commitment to the Far East, India, China, etc. Yeah. And I would like to ask you to give us your bird, bird eye view about what's going on in these two major economies. And the other topic that we would like to cover because b before we end is what's going on in Europe in terms of both business and uh, government. Okay, so China and India first. Uh, I, I, I'm, if one's looking for a V-shaped recovery, I think India, uh, China is probably the best example, but it's dangerous to extrapolate because it's much more of an authoritarian economy uh, and, and administration. Look what happens in Wuhan, you see uh, infection and immediately they're testing 11 million people. So amazing response to any suggestion of reinfection, but it, it has recovered very sharply. The big problem <clears throat> that I see is this lack of a relationship between the US and China. I think we all have to get our minds around the fact 
the rise of China. What, uh, many years ago, the Dutch Empire rose and fell. <coughs> the British Empire rose and fell, as you suggested, Yossi. The American, em the American Empire has risen, or the American currency has risen, and has been a bit on the down tick. The RMB has come back 200 years ago. China was, you know, uh, the, the, the Chinese currency, the RMB, was in the ascendancy, and China was... China and the BRICS and next level were 40% of worldwide GDP. That was 200 years ago. It went into decline and has come back again. But you're not going to stop the rise of China. So we have to figure out a way of coexisting constructively America and China. When I say we, I'm talking about America and China. The two top dogs have got to figure this out. If they don't, it will have severe repercussions. It already has because more and more we're looking inward. Self-sufficiency, look at the supply chain issue around Corona. What's the response to it? You can't have your supply chain dependent on Chinese manufacturing and partial distribution. So have your own supply chain elsewhere, maybe in another Asian country, or bring manufacturing back to America. This is all driving us inward. So I, I, I worry, to a tremendous degree about that. I don't have the solutions. And I don't think, by the way, that even if there was a change of administration in America, which I currently do not believe there will be, despite Scott Galloway's promised efforts over the next three months, despite, I don't think even if the Democrats were in control of the presidency, that it would change materially, because the Democrats, I think, have a similar view. So that's one thing. India. I worry about, I'm not worried about uh, in terms of the strength of the economy and the companies, you know, whether it's Mahindra or Tata or the Ambani's or uh, whatever, or Sunil Mittal, I mean, uh, and Airtel and all these companies, uh, these, these tremendous companies that have been built, uh, Bharti and, and, and others as well. I mean, these are incredible companies. But I do worry about the gap, the inequality issue not just within a country, but between countries, because the developed countries are going to come out of the coronavirus uh, crisis and epidemic and pandemic. They're going to come out of it stronger than the developing countries. India to date, maybe you know we've seen it in South Africa as well, to date, temperature probably has reduced the impact of corona. But you know, talking to somebody in South Africa yesterday, they're worried in a month's time when winter is eclipsed by summer and temperatures uh, 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 when the temperatures get uh, get um, fall down and winter winter comes in they're worried that corona will spread uh, argentina i was talking to somebody also yesterday similar worries they had a crisis a financial crisis before corona corona has made it doubly difficult for them so there are potential trouble spots and the differences are very great. And I worry about that in the context of India. Europe, um, I remain uh, pro-Europe. I remain uh, a Remainer. Maybe coronavirus, sadly, a sad thing to say, has made it slightly easier, not, not in terms of administrative burden and getting the deal worked out with the EU, but made it easier to disengage in a way not to be locked into Europe. But I am not, I, I want our business at S4 to be bigger uh, in Europe. We're not, for example, in Germany, and we have to be in Germany uh, in a fairly short period of time. That would be our 31st country. And I think then we will stop because you can hub things much more effectively nowadays than you used to when we were building up WPP and went into our 113 countries. There's no need to be in that number of countries. But I worry about Germany, France, Italy, Spain, and to some extent the UK uh, in the context of, West, of Western Europe. Currently, S4 capital is 70% North and South America, 20% Western Europe, and 10% Asia. I want it to be 40, 20, 40, because that's your phone. That's the prime minister calling you to invite you into the cabinet, Yossi. Um, Go ahead. It will, it, 
it will be 40 2040 because I want to get those bookends of North and South America where I think the growth will be uh, the, the significant growth and Asia Pacific where it will be too. So I worry about the impact not just of Corona, but of the, you know, if you look at Western Europe as a percentage of worldwide GDP, it's steadily fallen over the past few years. And I think will continue, that will continue to be a problem. And what about the type of governments? Well, the governments are becoming more and more populist. Uh, yeah. You know, part, part of the, the, the issue that we've all faced since the 1980s, the Reagan, Thatcherite economic philosophies, the, the monetary schools, the, the focus, you know, capital, capital as a proportion of GMP has risen and labor as a proportion of GMP has fallen. I think what's happened with Corona and the fiscal stimulus is it, it's marking it's a, it's a, a changing point. This is a, an iconic moment in that now we will see the the gap between capital and labor as a, a proportion of GDP narrow. But, you know, the only way that we will be able to pay for the fiscal stimulus that has been put into Corona is by heavier taxation. It's not going to be done in any other way. I mean, you can't go on printing money, otherwise the, the system will will bust uh, through through excessive inflation. And a lot of people are worried about it, even in its current step form. I'm not as worried about that. I think there is still significant deflation sort of capacity in the system. But if you print more money, it's going to become a problem. And I think what you have to do is to raise taxes both at an individual level and at a corporate level. So I think you are going to see a change. And I think that inequality gap is going to lessen but in the meantime governments will be more populist i mean you look at what you look at how boris johnson won the election in the uk he he defeated labor in its strongest constituencies the labor the red wall the labor wall in the the midlands and the the north of of the of england and he did that by appealing on a more populist platform around Brexit, take back control, which is a populist slogan, a brilliant campaign strategy, but it was executed extremely well. And the Remain campaign was uh, unable to carry the day, but it was a very, and that's how he won the election, because the election was all about getting Brexit done. Again, a very simple message. So. Um, I think that inevitably we will have more populism. What that means for the future of the EU, I think there will be more stresses and strains. You, you've already seen it in Germany with the court decision in relation to the fiscal stimulus or the, the court recommendation in relation to that uh, and the reaction for Ursula van der Leyen as a head of the EU about who, who, who is in, who's in charge. So these tensions... Uh, I think are going to escalate and will make Western Europe a more difficult place. Okay, so Martin, unfortunately, we have to to stop at this point, and we would like to move to to Q and A. I, I, I would like okay. to make one, one comment, uh, which you and I discussed before. We see your fingers; you have beautiful fingers. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just looking. I'm just looking at the uh, chat line. Go on, it's all right. Uh, unfortunately, I must tell you that I'm not as as optimistic as you because if you look at the size of the unemployment, it's like bigger than most of all the former recessions together in the last uh, century. And uh, it takes time to get to get out, you know, even if the people are walking very fast. If your friend comes with the, with the vaccine tomorrow, until he have, will have one billion bottles and put them in the one billion bottles and distribute them all over the world in, uh, in a cold storage, 
it will take time. I, I must admit that, you know, the, the, the major issue of ventilators was resolved in two, in two months, which is quite amazing, which can show you really when people are mobilizing their... Uh, and, 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 be, and, testing, and testing in America, to be fair, went from a very poor position to a very strong position, again, yeah. within a very short period of time. But still, you know, still you have a time issue. I have a friend in Turkey who told me that there is almost no traffic at the Bosphorus, which you yeah. know every, and I'm interested to know what's going on in uh, Singapore as far yeah. as the ship traffic. So you see that the international trade is very much down. And to get back out of all these things, I think will take take time, but uh, we should wait another year. We will invite you for next year and we will play parts of what you said uh, this time. And we but, will but I just, I just want to, I just want to cut across you there, Yossi, and I think so, this is really important. I think, you know, if you're running a business or trying to, uh, whether it's big, medium sized or small, you have two things you've got to do. One is you have to call it as it is. You have to tell people, the problems that you face and how difficult the situation is. But at the same time, you have to lay out a way out of this. You know, in all, you know, the Chilean mining disaster, you know, these 33 miners were trapped under 700 meters or whatever it was of impenetrable rock. Uh, ultimately, I think it was for 77 days, and people said it was impossible to get them out of it. It was impenetrable. A 23-year-old engineer, apparently, came up with a suggested solution which enabled them within 17 days to put a borehole through this hitherto impenetrable rock. You know, that old phrase that Morris Saatchi used to say to me, nothing is impossible. So you, you, have, to, you have to lay out a view as to how we get out of this. You can't, you can't, like Chicken Little, say that the sky is falling. I'm not saying that you should promise something. You know, the president of Chile in that example promised the Chilean population and the miners' families that they he would get them out of that hole they were in, dead or alive. He actually said dead or alive. I, I, you know, I. I reacted to that and thought if I was him, I wouldn't have said that, dead or alive. But he 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 set out the vision and the mission clearly. We're gonna get them out, come hell or high water. And I think I think that's we have to look at it. I think Scott Galloway said that he tends to look at things the glass half empty. Um I look at it the glass half full. And I think you have to do that. You know what Otherwise, is the difference? between uh, optimist and pessimist. No, go ahead. Pessimists see the glass half uh, empty. Optimists see the glass half full and realists take the glass and run away. <laughs> go there's, ahead. A sailing, there's a sailing analogy for that as well. Go on. So, what what is the, the, so, that, so that, that, that's where I would be on it. Anyway, go ahead. What are the questions? Okay. By the way, uh, apropos optimists and pessimists, you know, our former president, Shimon Peres, right. used to have a lot, lot of uh, smart sayings. So he said the difference, the difference between optimist and pessimist is that optimists see uh, opportunity at the end of every problem and pessimists see a problem at the end of every opportunity. <laughs> well, that's a good description of you and me, I think, probably. <laughs> I think you are optimist. Otherwise, you wouldn't start a whole new business. You know. That's right. That's right. That's How right. many? Well, people... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. How many people you have now? Twenty five hundred uh, people. Yes. Yeah. We started uh, eighteen twenty one months ago, and we have uh, twenty five hundred people. So we're responsible for seventy five hundred people. And by the way, you know, you talked about unemployment in America. Obviously, in the UK. A lot, seven million people, I think it is, have been furloughed by government programs. And that has been extended. We don't know quite, I think, yet what the terms of the extension are, but I think through to August. In America, of course, you know, the, the, the amounts of money that are being uh, filtering into lower income 
and, and lower middle income uh, hands is very significant. And a number of analysts believe, many analysts believe, that is sufficient to overcome the burden of employment. I mean, effectively, it's a subsidy to workers through these loans and, and uh, employment subsidies. But the, the fiscal stimulus, that stimulus will be saved by those lower income groups initially, but will eventually be spent into the economy. So we have to see how that filters through. And it comes back to what Mnuchin said, you know, we spent three trillion. Let's see, give me two weeks to figure out what the impact of that is. But we're here to do what is ever is necessary to deal with the problem that you that you lay out. So I'm 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 of the view that they that the authorities will do whatever is necessary to get the problem that you just outlined right. Now we spoke a little bit about the the gaps, you know, the gaps between countries and the the gaps between yes. people in, in given countries. Do you want to say a word about it? Well, I, I just think that's the that's the, the one of the big issues. Um, you've got a obviously inequality within countries. I think that's going to be rectified to some extent by what we are seeing happening now, but through taxation. Uh, I think that's the major the major change that we're going to see on the countryside. You know, I, for example, you asked me about India and China. I, I China, I think, you know, it's repairing the relationship between the US and China. I think that's that's fundamental. You're, just the numbers tell you that. If the world is 75 trillion of GDP and the US is 24 and China is 13 or 14, whatever it is, you know, one third of the almost trending towards one half of the world's economy in those, uh, those two countries. So it's essential that we work out some means of cooperation and coexistence. And one of the problems with Corona was the lack of international cooperation, at least with the financial crisis that we had in 2008, there was cooperation in trying to deal with it. So it's pretty, it's critically important. The inequality in countries, I think will be solved over time through increased by taxing the privileged and the wealthy. I mean, Corona, you know, this suggestion that Corona affects everybody equally is nonsense. It affects everybody unequally. You know, the, 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 the privileged and the resource you know, can, can handle it much more effectively. You and me can handle it much more effectively than most. You talk on your uh, own behalf, please. <laughs> no, you know, we got, we got a very interesting research yesterday in Israel about the relationship between contracting corona and the number of people per square uh, 1,000 meters in the country. Yeah. And it's totally obvious, you know, it's very clear that the dense, the denser the population, the higher is the rate of contraction of the disease, like the, the R factor, one, two, yeah. one to two. So there is no doubt that people of lesser means will are more susceptible to this disease. Big, big, yeah. big families, uh, smaller apartments, dense facilities, very bad. Well, of course, one one of the the big problems is in the Hasidic uh, communities, uh, where it, the, it's the population very, is very quite... un unpolitically correct. Uh, to say you have to wrap it in a nicer words, you know. Yes, but but in, let's say in the Orthodox communities, that that has been a problem. You know, in New York, however you wrap it, you know, see that has been a problem. We saw that in New York in the early stages. Uh, By the way, the, you heard the about this Korean Korean church, which was responsible to big uh, to big spread in uh, South Korea. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and another article showed that when you sing or shout, you spread much more uh, viruses. <laughs> so I'm not joking. I'm not joking. You know, okay. All these things are, are significant from statistics. So no, singing, no singing and no shouting. Yeah, so you go to football and you don't uh, shout and you do the, what is this uh, very, very, 
big event you have at the end of the year, the prompt, the, how do you call it? Where they sing. In yeah, the, the, pro the proms. The proms, yeah. So you should yes, do it okay. silently. Last night, last, last night of the proms, you mean? Right, yeah. right. So shouting, okay. remember, shouting is very it's dangerous for you. Okay. Okay, I think I think we exhausted the time of the of the questions. So we would like to invite our uh, guest uh, to ask questions in the next meeting with Martin. And now I will ask Steffi to get back on the stage to sum it up and to tell us what are the coming uh, event. And um, so Martin, we would like to thank you very much for the terrific job you you have done. And uh, Steffi, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you, Yossi. Thank, thank you, Yossi. You. Thank you, Sir Martin. It, it was great listening to you. I could hear far longer than the 45 minutes is nothing for your insights and for your, for your knowledge to talk with Yossi. It was great listening. Thank you for this. I'm, Thank, I you, learned a lot. Thank you, Steffi, for the opportunity. And, and the re invites is already on, on the way. Please come back to deal with <laughs> things. What are, with Steffi, the, what are the, the, next, the next events yes. we have? Tomorrow, tomorrow we will have Brian Eno and Hans Ulrich Oberst from Serpentine Gallery. I'm sure you all know um, that Brian Eno is one of the outstanding musicians of our time. He um, he started he started to be known with his influence on Roxy music, on Bono. He is not only doing pop music; he is a philosopher in music, and he is um, always on the edge of what's going on in, in music and arts. And I'm very happy that Hans Ulrich Obrist, our good friend since many, many years, will have an interview with him tomorrow at six here at DLD Think. And thank you um, for listening tomorrow. Thank you for listening today. And thank you for coming back tomorrow. And Martin, I hope to be able to pinch your cheek physically some time is, uh, in the near future i hope so too yossi it's been too long too long yeah and maybe you should you should step in and save the jewish chronicle you know you should maybe <laughs> by the, the newspaper <laughs> thank thank you for that kind kind suggestion Bubba. <laughs> <laughs> so have a good evening goodbye thank you steffi god bless Thanks. goodbye we love goodbye. you ciao we love you too thank you <laughs> ciao no.